It's the end of 2021 and time to reflect on the games that came out this year and, as must always be the case with subjective art, ruthlessly rank them and assign one of them the title of the best one of this year. Coming up today and tomorrow, it's the Outside Xbox and Outside Extra Crew's individual picks for Game of the Year, kicking off today with Luke and myself. Come on back tomorrow to see which games Jane, Mike and Ellen picked and let us know your personal pick for GOTY in the comments. Hello, I'm here to talk about my Game of the Year 2021, which was Resident Evil Village. Now, I consider myself a fan of the Resident Evil series, but that... Really? Yeah, but that had been something that was increasingly hard to say up until the release of Resident Evil 7. So 4 was great, 5 was bad, 6 was bad, Operation Raccoon City was bad, but then 7 came out. And I was like, oh, okay, this is good. This is fun. I'm enjoying this. So I kind of wanted to see what Resident Evil 8, or Resident Evil Village, as it came to be known, would be like, just in case it was, uh, it was a fluke. But the great news is that Resident Evil Village is, uh, is actually really good. So it's a good sign for the franchise. They've had two good games in a row, which hasn't happened since, like, the early 2000s. So that's, that's good. Where the hell am I? And I said I liked Seven, but for me, uh, Village blows Seven out of the water. And I really, really liked Seven. But there's something about the structure of Resident Evil Village that I really, really like. And this is going to sound weird, but it's structured like Disneyland. In that the village itself is like the central hub. And then you have these spokes coming off it that lead to like the different themed lands, which is what you get in Disneyland, but it's also what you get in Resident Evil Village. So you have the, the village, the central bit that you keep coming back to, and then you go off down the different spokes to like the vampire castle or the haunted dollhouse or the dam that's overseen by a weird fish man. And so you keep, you go down and you experience these like little self-contained uh, sort of mini adventures and then you come back armed with new equipment, uh, new abilities, like more health, more weapons, back to the area that was kind of really intimidating at the start of the game, and you sort of gradually get more powerful and uh, things start to open up in that kind of Metroidvania way. There are doors you can't open, bits that you can't get to, and you sort of gradually unlock more of the sort of central area as you keep coming back. And that, for me, that's like a, that's a really compelling uh, structure for a video game, the fact that you can keep, you go off and you come back more powerful each time. And each of the different levels is so well realized, like the Vampire Castle is great, and games would make that their entire game. They'd be like, right, Resident Evil 8 is vampires, you're in this castle, that's the new mansion, that's the game. But in Resident Evil Village, it's literally 90 minutes, you're in there, and then you're out and you've, you know, killed the vampire and you've the, half the castle's fallen down, you're like, right, what's next? Vampire lady. Oh yeah, where the hell, where the hell was she? Uh, she I talked about the vampire castle. I mean, I, we don't need what to get. What about the tall vampire lady? We don't need. There's so much has been said about the tall vampire lady. What more is there to be said? She's tall. People find her sexually attractive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good performance, yeah. But you know, I'm there. I'm there to do a job, which is to retrieve my crystallized baby head. <laughs> And he's role-playing, and obviously still mourning the death of Mia, his real wife, who he has a de tender and <laughs> Exactly. What kind of a husband would I be if I immediately started making out with a tall vampire lady <laughs> right over the crystallized head of our baby? <laughs> that is grounds for divorce. I understand. <laughs> ah, damn! Ah! Oh. And then you move on to the haunted dollhouse, which is, again, a completely different experience, you do that and then you move on to the dam, which is again, completely different. And you know, it's not perfect, they're not all amazing. It's like the problem with every Resident Evil game is there's always one bit that's set in some somewhere like industrial or a lab or some sewers, somewhere boring and it goes on for way too long and it becomes not fun. And in this game, that is the factory, which is towards the end of the game. So I think that was like a big criticism that people had, but even so, it didn't, I didn't feel, feel like it dragged too much for me and I was having so much fun anyway. Like the, just the general minute to minute gameplay, the combat and the survival horror, managing your resources and stuff is so compelling to me that none of that stuff bothered me. It's, also, it's weird and funny in a way that Resident Evil 7 isn't as well. Like a lot of really like hyper 
realistic or like surreal elements to it. Like the characters, like the Duke, who is just an extremely strange traveling merchant who can seemingly teleport around the map. The fact that you're like hunting for fish and he's cooking you up like rice pilafs that you're eating to extend your health bar. Apologies for the wait. Here's your share. The fact that you're doing like little rolling ball puzzles to unlock things. It, it's got that kind of late 90s, early 2000s like Japanese PlayStation game thing where you're like, a kid or a teenager and you're playing this and you're like, this is weird, but I'm sure I'll understand what this means when I'm an adult. And then you become an adult and you're like, no, that was just weird. But Resident Evil Village is full of that stuff, which I absolutely love as well. Ah, Miss Angie, just adorable. Porcelain dolls are very popular, you know. It feels like the, the successor, the heir to Resident Evil 4, which was my previously favorite Resident Evil game, in that it sort of carries on like a lot of the same feel, but also some of the um, some of the mechanics as well, like the merchant being in it, and um, it's also like Resident Evil 4 is packed full of secrets as well. Like there are whole puzzles, areas of the game. Like there's a uh, like a treasure tomb that you can completely bypass if you're not paying attention or if you just want to crit path it. It's got tons of that stuff with like loot that's actually worth having. Um, so it's not just like you play it and then you're done. Like I've played through it like two and a half times now, just going back to like look for secrets and find stuff that I, when I first played it through, I was like, I must explore that part of the map, but didn't get around to it. So I was like, well, this time I'm gonna go and find out what that's all about. And it's never disappointing. It's always something that's worth the journey. I'm interested to see if they can keep it up because uh, at the end of Resident Evil 8, there's a bunch of stuff with like government agencies and Resident Evil is always at its worst when it's dealing with like teams of commandos or government agencies or the military or something like that. So I'm really hoping they don't now take a sort of turn into that slightly boring corporate warfare Resident Evil that they, they tend to get bogged down in a lot. That was a lot of the stuff behind Operation Raccoon City and um, some of the Revelations stuff as well that I didn't really dig. But yeah, I'm hoping that this sort of the main series Resident Evil keeps on this trajectory because I'm really enjoying what they're doing with it at the moment. And Village was, was such a great game. Ethan, I heard explosions. What the hell happened? In terms of like honorable mentions, I kind of vacillated between this and Psychonauts 2, which uh, is getting my honorable mention for this year because I really, really had a good time with Psychonauts 2. It's a sequel to the original Psychonauts, which came out in 2005. It's a kind of action platformer based around this team of psychic commandos. They go into, inside people's brains and they, um, all the levels are based around jumping into the heads of uh, different people. And so the thing that that game has in, in spades is, is variety because inside of everyone's head is different and it changes up the gameplay so completely so often. Like, one level you'll be inside a sort of casino and you'll be uh, running around inside casino games, you'll be the ball in a pachinko machine, and then the next level you'll be uh, traveling around, like sailing a door on an ocean between islands, and it's a, just, again, a completely different gameplay style. Uh, the art style is amazing, all the character design, the music, uh, Jack Black is in it, he does a voice in that. Uh, you go inside his character's head and it's starts out completely black and then you kind of unveil all his different senses and the level sort of fills with color and music as you do it. It's just, it's beautiful. And I can see each molecule through my cosmic eye. I played through the whole thing in like two or three sittings. It's just really compelling. Had a really good time with it. Awesome production values, uh, great story and a surprisingly deft touch on the mental health stuff that it deals with, which I wasn't expecting, but was definitely welcome. So yeah, honorable mention goes to Psychonauts 2. I would definitely recommend people pick that up. Uh, but for my game of the year 2021, it's Resident Evil Village, which uh, I think if you haven't played it, and if you like horror, because it is pretty full on at points, there is some pretty grody stuff in there. But if you can deal with that, uh, Resident Evil Village is my game of the year. What did all this? Predictions, predictions for Resident Evil 9. Well, my prediction now is that it, you'll be playing as Ethan's daughter and it will be in a lab and there'll be men in suits and it will be like, oh, you have to topple the organization from within in this lab factory. Please don't do that. Set it in. Okay, we've already had a haunted dollhouse. Acceptable settings. Um, well, mansion, 
do it in a mansion, or a train that looks like a mansion, or a boat that looks like or a mansion, a or a police like a station mansion. that looks like a mansion. Okay, what haven't they done? Zeppelin, airship, like airship that looks like a mansion. Space station that looks like a mansion. Uh, I don't want to get Jason, Jason X on this. That's not. Yeah, you do. No, I don't. <laughs> Resident Evil should be the franchise that gets uh, a yearly game like FIFA. Or, instead of FIFA or Call of Duty, you know how we get one every year. Let's get a story-based first-person Resident Evil game yearly. set in something. That, yes, yearly. I want them yearly. Like you call know it. they'd be bad. If they no, they'd be good. Just to, you've already got the engine. All you need to do is come up with a new thing that's a mansion. All you need to do is make it's come, Resident yeah, Evil. Yeah, exactly. A big car that's a mansion. Or uh, I'm an into that. underground mansion. Submarine. Submarine mansion. This is all gold, Capcom. Hello, Luke. Hello? Tell, tell me now, what is your game of the year 2021? Metroid Dread! What? <laughs> yeah! What? <laughs> Metroid Dread! Are you for serious? With an honourable mention to Monster Hunter Rise, ended up set, uh, sinking hundreds of hours into that game. Good fun. Uh, uh, Monster Hunter, a long-running, respected series that I actually have played relatively little of, and um, but ended up really, really loving 2021's entry, and actually, that is exactly the same situation that I found myself in with Metroid. Uh, I'm a big Nintendo fan, so have absorbed a lot of love of the Metroid series. But in terms of actual games, I've played like two of them before. I don't think I've finished either because they're hard and you get lost a lot. And well, I, don't, I don't know if you ever tried them. They're hard. You get lost a lot. <laughs> Metroid, it's been nearly two decades since the last 2D Metroid game came out. Uh, if you're not familiar with the series, you play as a bounty hunter, hunter a bounty hunter called Samus, uh, who invariably at the start of each game ends up losing all the powers you worked so hard to acquire in the last game and has to run around uh, a, a large interconnected world uh, getting one power up that lets her go back to somewhere she's already been, but now go through a new door because now she's got the thing that gets you through the new door. And, and, and you sort of work your way outwards like a spider building a web, this, this vast sci-fi map. Uh, I am describing the genre Metroidvania, which is the which Metroid and Castlevania are sort of named for Castlevania. Named for, named for Castlevania, and also for Metroid. And that that's, actually that that's why. Uh, Metroid Dread is my game of the year because uh, it has been two decades since the since you know a new a completely new 2D Metroid game uh, was released that was on the Game Boy Advance uh, you know like a really really long time ago and in that time the Metroidvania genre has gone from strength to strength and you've had incredible games like uh, Guacamelee the two Ori games, which I know Ellen is a huge fan of. Woo! There we go. And uh, I think probably most notably Hollow Knight, which is up there as you know one of the greatest games ever. Uh, and, and basically there have been loads of games in the Metroidvania mold that have done it incredibly well in the time that Metroid has been away. So when they announced that Metroid Dread, the long awaited uh, you know, Metroid Dread was actually coming out, I was excited, but I also wouldn't have been at all surprised if uh, basically, it felt uh, like a little bit late to its own party, like a sort of boxing heavyweight champ who comes out of retirement but can't quite stand up to the, you know, the young uh, bo box, the little Mac, little Mac. So it could it could easily have been a little Mac situation. But as it turned out, Metroid Dread was was brilliant. It's one of the best Metroidvania games out there. It feels incredibly satisfying to play. I think that's the thing about it. When I look at footage, I feel a little bit like this about Breath of the Wild. When I look back at footage, I think, why do I like this game so much? But when, when the control is in your hands, it's a different story. It feels incredible. The animations are beautiful, silky smooth. Samus is a complete badass throughout. And just getting around is an absolute joy. It's also got one of the best maps I've ever seen in a video game. It has this incredible feature, which is revolutionary which lets you highlight every door on the map for the, that is opened by the thing you just got. So in terms of like backtracking and figuring out where you can go next, it makes navigating this vast world way easier. And actually, although I got lost a few times, the level design is so brilliantly intelligent that actually you'll, you'll, you'll get a new power up and you'll you know, have loads of options of where to go next. 
and you'll just pick one seemingly at random, be like, uh, I don't know, this one, and you'll head down that path and find out that actually that is where you're supposed to be going because the game has been subconsciously brilliantly shepherding you through. And so actually this, this huge world that you could easily get lost in, for the most part, it, you feel like you always know where you're going and it, it makes sense in a way that you absolutely wouldn't expect. I also would shout out the boss fights, which are unbelievably hard, really, really savagely difficult. Uh, and something that I've learned about myself in the last few years is that um, I, I actually really like it when games are, 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 are so, so hard as to be almost unenjoyable. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but but they but they are very very gratifying, and and extremely enjoyable and very well designed. And there's some you know returns of old Metroid favourites. Uh, Would you say it psychically manipulates you like Darren Brown, but for good? Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to get that whole thing in camera? No. As if. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Good yes. My own observation. Yeah. <laughs> it's it psychically manipulates you like Darren Brown, but good. Yeah, so it's got this new feature that they've not done in a Metroid game before, or in fact in, I can't think of another example of it, of something like this in a game of this type. There are these robots that hunt you relentlessly, um, and you cannot beat them, uh, and if one of them catches you, you have a sort of split second, I think it's randomised, chance to uh, sort of stun them and, and break free for a few seconds, but it mostly, it, you know, is difficult and can't be done, so... Uh, uh, most op most likely, if an enemy gets you, you will be insta-killed in a fairly unpleasant cutscene. Um, another aspect of Metroid Dread that I was worried about, because I thought that doesn't actually sound like a great deal of fun, but, as I said, Samus is such a badass that what the Emmy sections do is that they do turn that on its head and they make hiding and sneaking feel very exciting and, and, and very cool. And actually, when you do eventually get to uh, destroy an Emmy, it is incredibly uh, satisfying and you really feel like you're, you know, striking a blow for the good guys. Um, uh, in the end, I ended up 100%ing Metroid Dread. And as far as I can remember, the only video games ever that I've 100%ed were Pokemon Red and Metroid Dread. And I only do ones that rhyme and have that <laughs> syllable count. <laughs> So if you can think of another, I can see and Andy's thinking right now. Metroid Dread, Red Dead. Pokemon Red, Red Dead, Red Dead, Red Dead, Red Dead Two, Red Dead. No, I'm not 100%. No, it's too massive. It'll take ages. <laughs> another thing I liked about Metroid Dread uh, was that um, I, I caught COVID this year, which which sucked. Um, but I had my Switch and Metroid at the point where I was like lying in bed feeling really sorry for myself. I was going to ask how much of this is based on the fact that you had COVID and couldn't do anything but play Metroid Dread. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was uh, I was very pleased that if I had to be stuck in bed feeling rubbish and feeling sorry for myself, that I had uh, a, a Metroid game there. And I, yeah, and so that's that's part of why I 100%ed it because you know. 100%ing is really rewarding. You have to do all of these really gymnastic, difficult, multi-stage feats of jumping that use all of the powers together. Um, it, it's a brilliant Metroidvania game, and I can't believe they came back and just, you know, knocked it out of the park like that. It was a great time from start to finish. Best game of 2021. Also, though, Monster Hunter, that was nice. Judged, yeah, it needs two syllables to begin with. Oh, okay. Although, Pokemon Red, Metroid, Dread. Yeah. It needs more than one syllable to start with. Okay. Dragon Ball Z? Dragon Ball Z. Okay. Oh, yeah, there, Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> <laughs> as, it's, as it's pronounced. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next game to be 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, having given you my opinion, which I'm sure you trust, uh, now I, respected games journalist Luke Westway, I'm off to 100% Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Dragon Ball Fighter Z. <laughs> Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Yeah. Yeah. Metroid Dread's good, so give it a chance. Give it a chance. I thought as much. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Siri.